Oh, All right, people, I think we're ready here. Hola, buenos dias. Um, uh, Can you say? Um, <laughs> all right, everyone. So we're going to try to do things a little bit differently here today. We obviously we have this wonderful, amazing panel full of wonderful, amazing people. But we recognize that we also have all of you amazing people in the room here. Um, and to do things, I guess, open stack style, we actually even have an Etherpad going. Uh, if yeah, the link is up there. I think several people have tweeted the link. Um, but the hope is, is that there's obviously a lot of ideas, a lot of opinions, a lot of definitions even of what interoperability is. And with kind of one of the big themes of this summit uh, being the interop challenge, uh, I think it's just a great idea for everyone to get together and discuss some of these topics. So uh, if you've got a question, like I said, don't be shy. Put something in the etherpad, shout it out. I can run up to you with a mic. Um, you know, it, you can do whatever you want in the etherpad. If you have your favorite ASCII yard, I don't care. That seems exciting. Um, <laughs> so, all right. We might as well go ahead and get started. Um, I think just obviously with the name of this presentation being uh, interop, what you think it means isn't necessarily what I think it means. Maybe we should start out with whatever the official definition is of interop is. Um, and I'd like each of the panelists to introduce themselves. And uh, Chris, being that you, you represent the foundation, I think you should go first. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Chris Hodge, and I'm the interop engineer for the OpenStack Foundation. And I've been uh, working on interoperability for, with, uh, um, you know, it's kind of my full time job for a couple of years now. And, um, you know, I kind of, I think of more of a formal, you know, definition of what an interoperability means, um, which, you know, kind of boils down to interfaces that are, uh, discoverable, meaning that uh, you know you you're able to to discover what an interface you know is and how to use it. Um, you know, there it's it's durable, meaning that it's um, it, it persists over time. If you think about like you know the, you know interoperable interfaces that we deal with every day in our lives could be like you know even just like power sockets, where you, you know that is they you know varying from country to country. It's always the same, no matter where you go, and it's always usable. Um, and the final thing being open, that uh, that that it, th there are interfaces that um, you know aren't proprietary and aren't um, you know specifically restricted to only um, y you know one you know one particular group. And so those are kind of the three conditions that I see when we talk about an interoperable interface. Awesome. So that's that's our like definition. But how about the rest of you guys? How how do you view interoperability? Do you want to go? Uh, yeah, whoever is most eager. I'll go first. Uh, so my <laughs> name is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, I served on the OpenStack board for four years, and um, I am sort of the considered the the, per, the def core person. Although I let's taken over in March. Thank you guys for carrying the torch. Um, and um, so that, and then my day job, uh, I am a co-founder of a company that does hybrid infrastructure automation. So we really care about things like making a OpenStack, Google, Amazon, and Metal all work together, right? Interop. So my definition for interop, um, after sort of going through the, the crucible of DEF Core, um, is a contract. So it, it really comes back to a contract that multiple people have agreed to enforce. Um, and that means that when you are using a service, that service provides a, a contract that you can count on to persist both over time and across multiple vendors. So my name is Paul Tchaikovsky. I'm a cloud engineer at IBM. Uh, my, my perspective comes uh, from the kind of operator slash user perspective. Uh, and my thoughts around interop is more about, less about like the API specifically, and more about the, the usability and the, and the behavior. So it doesn't worry me so much if like, one has a slightly different API to another or has a slightly different way of giving me a network than another, just mm -hmm. that it can give me a network and the way it does give me a network is documented well enough and supported in the ecosystem of, uh, of tools for doing deployments on the cloud. Um, that's, yeah, that's where I'm focused at thinking about interop. Okay. So my name is Catherine Deep. I work for IBM and I have been working with Rob since day one on interoperability for OpenStack. Um, as you just see, uh, each one of us have different definition of interops. So for me, the ability to be able to test whatever uh, defin definition of interop that we all agree with, I mean, 
still a lot of discussion and still evolving. But the testability aspect of it is essential. Essential for us to know, to, to, to know that whether we really have a common core or not. So to me, wh whatever interarmor uh, um, definition that we agree with, we should never forget the testability aspect of it. And for that, why, why my definition is so centralized on test aspect, because I'm the PTL of the RevStack project. Awesome, thanks guys. And so just now we, we talked this over with our panelists, but you know, let's get some morning exercise here, because let's be honest, this is pretty early for Barcelona time. Um, everyone bear with me. So if, if you're a user of an OpenStack cloud, raise your hand. Oh, yeah, I kind of figured an OpenStack conference that might be. No, keep, keep your hands up, everyone. Keep your hands up. All right, now, if you also operate an OpenStack cloud, raise your hand. But keep that other hand in the air if you were part of the first group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah get those hands in the air yeah. like you just don't care. Um, <laughs> all right, I know. Uh, finally, how many of you are you know, currently using some form of multi-cloud? If the answer is yes and you already have two hands in the air, you better just give yourself a hug because you probably need one. Um, <laughs> so, all right, so that's, that's good to know with the room. So, you know, to kind of get into the meat of it, we've already got kind of netted out the, some of the topics that we want to discuss. I think the first one, you know, why are we even talking about interoperability when here we have this, this thing, this amazing, wonderful universe of, of OpenStack, but it is just one code base. Why is interoperability an issue when you have just one code? So you guys, who's most eager to? Paul, you look really eager. <laughs> I'll, I'll happily take that one. Uh, so we, we uh, deploy a lot of clouds and we have like 4,000 configuration settings or something ridiculous that you can uh, set in, inside of OpenStack. And each one of those in some way, shape or form affects the behavior of the resultant cloud. Um, you know, even if you're fairly cook cookie cutter in how you build them, uh, some choices, uh, either yours or customer choices about whether they want Swift or whether they want block storage or what the networking in the data center looks like um, makes uh, from small to large changes to the behaviors of, of the cloud that they end up with. You know, the APIs all might be the same, but the underlying behaviors uh, can become quite different. Right. I'm not sure the APIs are all the same. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a really interesting uh, point about, you know, the idea that OpenStack is one thing. Um, hopefully people in the room understand it's not, just even you know, which projects you've implemented. But the, the fallacy that we sort of started with when we did the DEF core work was there's a lot of discussion about using code and APIs and requiring both. And as we got into the, into the meat of the matter, it became clear that when you look at time drift, different versions, right? OpenStack has significant variation of version to version code, APIs drift, code drifts, things like that. It becomes very hard to actually point at any OpenStack cloud and say what code is in it, what code it's running, if it's the right code and things like that. And so we really found, I, I found is that as we got into test, it became very hard to sort of use the code as a, well, if we all use the same code, that will solve all the problems. And not even the config, you could use the same code and configure it a thousand ways. Um, and so we, we really found that interop was not solved by the assumption of same code, same behavior, same API. Yeah, all right. Uh, Chris, Catherine, anything? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I mean, what, you know, kind of, you know, what, what, what they, 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 they said just a second ago is that there are so many different configurations and there's so many different drivers, and this is, this is part of the openness of our community. And, and, I, and I actually do think that, that the, the work we've done on interoperability has, has helped, though, um, by, by defining what, what behavior there, that there needs to be to be able to call yourself OpenStack in some, you know, official legal way. Um, I, I, I think that it's helped define a, a, a core set of APIs and, and some expected behavior. Um, and, and, and while it may not be, um, it may not cover all of the behavior that you can do, that you can, that you can build out with an OpenStack cloud, I, I, you know, I, I actually think that it's, um, it's helped focus our community in general, and it's not, not just the development community, but also the vendor community. Um, to, to make them realize that even though there, that there is a tremendous amount of configuration options that you have, that you, 
if you if you drift too far away from what you consider to be, you know what you know what 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 the, what the Def Core working group has has you know with you know under the you know with the board and the foundation and the community has defined to be essential capabilities that a cloud has to have that that's okay because we're open but that doesn't mean that you get to call yourself open stack anymore so um, for me <coughs> being um, able to test some things um, my dream is uh, I should not care what you configure how you build your cloud um, if I want a VM and, and connectivity with the outside world, I should be able to just get that um, without worry about the underlying uh, cloud configuration. So, so that is the goal that we, we try to get to. Um, maybe one of the way to get to is to start with, and we already did that, is to, find, to define a very uh, a finite, uh, 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 behaviors that we all try to enforce. Uh, just give an example. If I would like to uh, build, uh, create a VM with external uh, connectivity, as a tester, I should not care whether you use floating IP, you use a VLAN with a public accessible uh, capability, or anything like that. All I know is I, create, I would be able to create a VM and I would have connection. So that would be the goal that we, we would like to get to. Right. I, if that's, I'd like to discuss that a little bit more. Okay, one, one of the things I think that's really interesting to think about with this is that you know, it's a lot of people at OpenStack and OpenStack Summit are using OpenStack for their own internal, internal function, and that's th they're trying to be successful. CERN's a great example, right? A huge pool of OpenStack resources that they consume internally, but that doesn't create an ecosystem on top of OpenStack. And one of the things is the board, and part of the original vision going back to the first, first summit, was to create an ecosystem around OpenStack where a vendor would say, I could sell you a service or a product or an extension that would be portable for the vendor to create the ecosystem in a market, mm -hmm. has to be able to sell it to multiple vendors. And yes. so if they can't show up at your site with confidence that your OpenStack cloud is going to work the way somebody else's OpenStack cloud has worked, or figure out what the differences are easily, then, then we haven't actually created an ecosystem on top of OpenStack, right? A lot of people here are worried about just using OpenStack for their private infrastructure, and they don't think about the, the benefits they get when we can actually move workloads or vendors or capabilities site to site to site or customer to customer to customer. It's a big, it's a very important thing to build. Great, and so, uh, you know, getting kind of onto the, transitioning to the next point, so obviously, you know, although we had, you know, this really amazing keynote yesterday with, you know, it, it's hard to order, like, some pizzas for 16 people and figure out how to all work together to do that, let alone figure out an, an interoperability challenge. I mean, that's a real challenge, people. So just, if we could give a round of applause for everyone who participated awesome. in that, I think that would just be amazing. How many, peop um, how many people <laughs> did? How many people were on the stage? Do we have a couple of the... Yeah, really, really great job, everyone who's involved with that. Um, that, that was, there was a lot of work going into that. that yeah, awesome. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, with that, I think it's interesting to kind of understand what was the journey that, you know, before even you get to something like an interop challenge. Obviously, we have things like RefStack and DefCore um, that have, you know, for a while been looking at some of these interoperative issues, but, you know, now have kind of come to emerge as part of this challenge. How, how would you guys like to describe that journey, being that you, you um, I think many of you have been around since the beginning. Okay, I'll we'll start this yeah, go for it, yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, so, so for me, um, uh, dev core, dev core define a core uh, that um, ref stack will, uh, will try to test and enforce. So, so from that point of view, it is a, uh, um, a, a still at the foundation area. So with interop challenge, one of the things that we've, we, we try to test is with these criteria and the testing that we have done, in reality, where, where are we in terms of interoperability? We go up one level at the application level, uh, in this case, a LAMP stack. How does it behave? How, is our criteria good so far? If there are gaps, what are they? Okay. 
Yeah, it's going next. Okay. So uh, for me, uh, about a year ago, I was actually having an argument with Rob on Twitter, um, which if you don't re frequently Just have arguments ago? with Rob on Twitter, you should uh, do it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and out now of that, I was... Like, they're all going to be troubling you now. Out of that, I was like, which is okay, good. Please. I really want to... Uh, I really want to show like wh where I think Interop should work. So I put together a bunch of uh, tooling using Terraform, which I put up on the OSOps uh, Contrib uh, GitHub repo that showed using Terraform to install a few things like, uh, I think it was a Docker Swarm, there was Kubernetes, and there was an Elk stack. And I said, look, this is how we can show Interop um, by using a, like an, even an external ecosystem tool. And then people can run this and say, hey, this works, this doesn't work. PR changes so that it can work on their, their cloud as well as our cloud and kind of figure out what some of the differences are and maybe even push up to Terraform and say, hey, here are some changes we need to make to your OpenStack support to make it you know, more suitable for more clouds. And uh, given that the, open, the, the interrupt challenge actually ended up in OSOps mm -hmm. uh, Contrib, I'm gonna take credit for most of it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> There's a Twitter we're starting right there. Um, Yes, yeah, this is something that we really, it was a long-term vision. It took three years to go through the board process, right? Down, we had to start with principles. We had to really work through what we were doing and why we were doing it. And there were a lot of compromises and, and pieces along the way. So, so it, you know, it obviously is a political, can be a very political, was a political process. Um, because at the end of the day, for Interop, you have to be able to say no to things. And you can't say no in an arbitrary way in a community like this. You have to give reasons, you have to give rationale, you have to give weighting and a process to do it. And so one of the things that is worth thinking through with the, this interop question is when you say this is the standard part of OpenStack, that means there's a whole bunch of stuff that's not. And especially with Big Tent showing up, we have this huge bathtub curve of APIs where there's a small set that are, that are gonna be common and then there's a whole bunch of optional pieces and you have to be able to have a, a process that says, yes, this has become a standard part and this one hasn't. So RefStack is a big part of that. That's why it's, we've been Def doing Core. that for a long time. DefCore is the process by which we say yes and no to things. And it has to be transparent and predictable. Um, and actually one of the things that was really important for us early on is it has to drive community behaviors. So if you, if you create a, a system that allows gamification of the APIs, those APIs have commercial value. Um, and it's important when you think about, hey, we're talking about interop and making all this stuff work, it's a big deal. Um, but we also don't want to create interop in a way that advantages one vendor or has them pull the project in strange ways. Um, and so you have to put that hat on when you think about this in a historic perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's, it's, not, it's not just about the, the kind of definition of interoperability that the, that the DEF Core working group has has come up with that so, so much of the success on stage yesterday depended upon tools that the community built in the OpenStack ecosystem. Mm -hmm. and, and you can, you can talk about the library shade, which you know, the, it was kind of originally joked as every line of shade is, should be considered a, a, a bug um, because, it's, because it's something where there's a difference between clouds and, and, and OpenStack. But I think that the, the authors of that, of that uh, of that library have changed their point of view on that and are actually seeing it as the, the interoperability library. That, 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 that once we accept that there are going to be some level of differences between clouds and our ecosystem, Shade provides us a common way to, um, to, to, to access those clouds. And, it, and, it, and it, for the end user, it, 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 um, it, it, it hides some of those differences. So like Catherine was talking about, if you don't, if you don't, if you only care about booting a machine with a network on it, then shade is a, shade is a way that that allows you to do that. So it, it's so so it, it's not just you know work that's done by you know by you know by, by the Def Core committee, but also work that's been done by our community by the by the people who are using clouds on a day to day basis. And I think that it really speaks to the strength and maturity of OpenStack. You know that we that we that we had 16 different clouds on stage. You know, including different different processor architectures. Oh, great! I was just about to ask if anyone has any questions. We actually have T-shirts for those that uh, you know are <laughs> ready to get involved. Yeah. It's one size fits all T-shirts. Yeah, though. Chris. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chris, I'm very happy that you mentioned the shade because when we did the 
uh, interrupt challenge, you know, that's the tool that we use the most. Well, that's the only tool we use, actually. Uh, it, it is, well, yeah. uh, so my question is that um, moving forward, uh, you know, the interrupt challenge group, how do we work with the uh, shade project and uh, make sure that, uh, you know, whatever we find, that you find actually influence that uh, project um, so that the, the, the API is very uh, capable of doing what we want it to do. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's an, I mean, it's an open project within our, within our, within our, within our ecosystem, and so that that's one of the nice things about it is as, as, people's needs grow, they can they can grow the capabilities of the library too. Um, but also from the from the point of view of the, the interoperability working group, you know how that how that informs us. We have we have criteria that helps us define what we want the next, you know what we think are the APIs that are important to try to enforce across clouds. Mm -hmm. And Shade, in some sense, becomes a tool identifying what the APIs are that real cloud users are are using. And we and we can take um, we can take that into account when we're um, when we're evaluating current and future APIs for inclusion. Okay. I, Thanks. I, I, don't, I, don't share, I don't share the enthusiasm for shade. <laughs> I, I agree with the original idea that shade's, shade's a, a, a defect. Um, and I, I think that while it, it, it gives us sort of a, a way to cope with the fact that we have a lot of heterogeneity among the cloud infrastructures, it keeps us from actually solving the problems because Shade's a Python library. If you're consuming the clouds from other libraries or even from the OpenStack CLI, you don't get those benefits. And, and then so, and it, it still, it just it puts the onus back on the user or the person creating a configuration file within Shade. Uh, it doesn't actually address the underlying interoperability problems that OpenStack has. Um, and even more, when I look at interoperability, right, because I, I, I have tooling that works on Amazon, Google, OpenStack, right, physical infrastructure. Uh, the differences, behavior differences, going back to one of Paul's points, the behavior differences in those different clouds is very, is, is very concerning. And the fact that we can gloss over that with a, with a Python library keeps us from having a hard discussion about fixing those fundamental problems, making the APIs discoverable so I can ask an OpenStack cloud, what implementation have I done? So, I, you know, we're, we're hiding it for somebody. It made, the, it made the interop challenge work well because we had a Python tool calling into OpenStack, but I don't think that that's the same as actually creating real interoperability. When I talk to people in the field, the re, you know, they use Amazon and Google as much or more than OpenStack. And so interoperability with those platforms is important to our user community in a, in a very significant way, and we need to consider that. that. That, to me, is as much a part of this discussion, should be as much a part of this discussion. Clearly what you're saying, and I think there was one of the presentations uh, at the summit where somebody's showing from Horizon Dashboard going to Amazon or whatever, I think, I think you, you're making some valid points that we're always customer driven and, you know, crawl was, all right, make sure all these open stacks are operable, and then a second phase, like you're saying, is, okay, now let's make this work well with these other, these other clouds. The, I, yeah, I, I don't mean to diminish the challenge. I no, think no, that no. the challenge was a significant accomplishment, and it shows where we've gotten to with, with API interoperability, mm -hmm. and the fact that you know Def Core and RefStack are helping people get to a point where the APIs are consistently working, which is a big deal. It certainly is. When we started this stuff back at the San Diego summit, um, you know, that you couldn't count on OpenStack APIs at the most basic levels to work together. There were all these extensions. It was crazy. Um, so. Yay, huge. Um, but I also think that it's easy in a, in a community like this to take something that sort of is, a, is a, a bomb, say, all right, we don't have to worry about that and fix it, and we, we, it's, it's harder to keep the focus on the hard problems. But, but, I don't, but I don't think that the two exist in isolation from one another. That's that, true. That, that's one, one thing that I've seen in the two years since I, since I started this work is 
there, there has been what I would almost consider a recommitment from the community to preserve um, API compatibility across versions. And so you look at things like Cinder, which just announced the version mm -hmm. 3 library, which is actually entirely backwards compatible um, with, with, with the version 2. Or you look at work that's being done with, within the Glance community, in part as a direct response to the concerns raised by the, by the DEF Core working group about how to build a discoverable image API that still allows you to have multiple implementations. Or even implementations that have recently landed in Neutron about um, you know, just a single API for attaching a network. Um, you know, these are all things that, that you, know, well, you know, we don't want to take all of the credit for that, but they have, um, uh, the work that we've been doing with DEF Core has helped drive, um, you know, some of that development. And I'd like to point out that actually, I think in many ways, DEF Core kicked off the whole awareness of the lack, the the multiple ways of doing things and the, the need to actually converge. And now there are multiple projects that are actually working towards that. We've got DevCore RevStack, we've got the Interop Challenge, we have the OpenStack client, mm -hmm. we have uh, the API working group. I think the real key to to keep this going and spur it on is to get, and it is also happening right now in that the node pool is, is being expanded to be much more multi-node testing as opposed to the, the old dev stack model of everything in a, on a single uh, machine. And when the developers start feeling the, more of the pain and start seeing the differences. And they are starting to do that. I think we are, as a community, starting to converge. And I think that's a sign of maturity. And, and that, to me, uh, API is the foundation layer. If the API level is not, uh, does not interop, shade, Terraform, Ansible, it will not work. So to me, that foundation layer that DevCore has been carving out this, this, this limited, important APIs that need to be uh, uh, interop or compatible for all uh, open stack eco in the OpenStack ecosystem is important foundation layer. So back, back on the shade topic a little bit, I, I don't really feel like you know, the, each line of shade demonstrates a defect. I think it's more each line of shade demonstrates somewhere we could probably improve things. Um, the, way, the way I look at things, if you're using the CLI or Horizon or whatever, you, you're probably not doing a ton of stuff um, that are complicated things. If you're doing complicated things, you're gonna be using uh, something out in the ecosystem like Terraform or Ansible or Share or Puppet or whatever, or one of the many cloud SDKs and, and going that way and doing the whole infrastructure as code thing. And if you're doing that, then we have ways of working with differences in the different clouds. We just need to know that they exist, and we just need to find out what, what the capabilities are or what the differences are, which is kind of what Rob was touching on, and mm -hmm. figuring out, like can, like, can we ask the cloud to tell us what it supports, or can we at least get good pointers to documentation, and can we get people working with, out with the ecosystem, working with you know, Terraform, uh, like go, go for cloud, live cloud, all those things to help right. bridge those gaps and bring shade-like um, uh, usability into some of those other tools that are commonly used. Uh, and we probably have information about what those tools in the, you know, the OpenStack user survey and stuff. So that may help us target which of those tools are the best ones to, you know, really show off as like best of breed. These are the best ones to use with OpenStack, and then hopefully then that will encourage the rest of the ecosystem to improve themselves mm -hmm. um, because, and you know, form some healthy competition. So I, th I think that's an interesting point. The issue, Mark has a question yeah. next. The, the issue that um, shade, you know, the shade configuration file is maybe the defect um, and the extent to which you could inspect an OpenStack cloud and get that configuration information, that would be sufficient in my mind. Um, it's the fact that you have to put an entry into a file that says this is the behavioral characteristics of my OpenStack cloud. 
One thing that, that we sort of gloss over but was a huge point in this, when Def Core came out, it's not a version, it's not an OpenStack version spec. And this is a really important point for people to think about with OpenStack. The Def Core standards are dates. They say, on this date, this is, the, this is what we expect your behavior to be. And then you can go back and say, I want to go back to the 2016 March um, spec, and I need you to conform to that. We're not saying it's Cactus or Kilo or Mataka or Liberty. It's, this is the, the, the API spec that we conform to on those dates. And so it becomes a sliding window of, of date conformance. So you, it's important when you think about interop to you know, not, you're not supposed to care what version somebody's running. And, and that is a, it, it's a very different thought process if you're used to thinking about, oh, I, ran, I started running Liberty and it's gonna solve these problems. Uh, from an uh, interop perspective, it's not about Liberty or any version. It's about the behaviors that you get. So one of the themes you're kind of both hitting on there is discoverability, which has been kind of a hot topic with Def Core lately. Um, and especially on the operator side, that's uh, operator choices seem to impact discoverability a lot more. So it's things like, you know, I can make a change to policy.json that says you can't upload an image to my cloud, right? Um, and there's actually no good way to discover that if you're a client other than try it and fail, um, which is kind of a terrible thing for brand users. So since we have an operator on the end of the bar here, um, one of the interesting things is that neither Def Core guidelines today nor the interoperability challenge really address the operator side of things. Um, Def Core doesn't accept tests that require admin credentials, uh, and the interoperability challenge was an end user workload, right? So, and one of the things that you said, Paul, was that um, the APIs aren't necessarily the thing that you guys care about, it's more the behavioral differences. So what does a set of tests look like for an operator that would be good for interoperability? I might have to talk into, mic, into this <laughs> mic over here. <laughs> you, you want me to stall? I'll, I'll stall for you. So Paul thinks that this is a really challenging question. Uh, that actually gave me a couple of moments to think. So I, I think, I mean, wh when we're doing CI for our tooling, uh, we are doing, can I spin up a VM? Can I attach a, a, a cinder volume to it? Can I attach an IP address to it? We're doing a lot of that sort of stuff. So I think being able to codify scenarios and, and moving those and really testing out the behaviors uh, maybe even doing something a little bit complex, like uh, you know, Docker Swarm, or yeah, all the way up to like something crazy like Kubernetes, where there's a lot going on, and you're testing a lot of the capabilities of the cloud rather than just a, a couple of things, and you're testing them all as like a, a, as a as a unit together, rather than saying, I span up a machine, I span it down, I created a cinder volume, I, I destroyed the cinder volume, I put a thing in a bucket, I deleted the thing in the bucket. Right. I I think that. When we look at, um, I've become a big fan of splitting the Def Core tests from um, Tempest, because Tempest really tests utility like that, and I think the Def Core should add tests that, that actually test behaviors. Did I get a Linux machine? Do I have CentOS available? Do I have an externally accessible network that I can, you know, those, those things are actually operable issues that somebody trying to use the cloud cares about. Um, and I would, I'm actually a big fan of, of splitting those out. From an admin perspective, um, this is way deep legacy, but there, we, Def Core used to score, initially scored admin tests, um, and we, for good reasons, pushed them off into the future. But the goal was not to never have admin tests. It was to say that we would have different classes of tests and that we would eventually get to specialized silos of you know, core plus admin, core plus telecom core plus something else. And I would love to see that come back in. It's just we're not as fast as I was hoping we were a couple of years ago. But what, what you mentioned, especially around um, you know, not being able to upload a glance image until you try, that, that, that's pretty bad and it's pretty common all across a lot of things. And the error message you get back, uh, even then, <laughs> are not like, it doesn't say you can't do this because of a, a, of a policy setting. It just says error kind of thing. So, Getting, getting better errors um, into uh, the clients uh, is very important. A lot of the times, the only way to find out what happened is to read the logs, and you don't necessarily want to give the user access to read the logs on the hypervisor that they're trying to launch a VM on. <laughs> and, and, and one last thing about, you know, about you know, you know, operators of clouds. I mean, I mean from, the, from the administrative point of view of, of, of watching uh, you know, number you know over forty vendors now. You know, 
you know, running the tests and submitting passing test results is the, the clouds that have the most difficult time passing are the ones where the operators haven't been testing, where they've, they've, they've made decisions about you know, implementation decisions or they've made changes to code, and they're not running the tests to understand how those changes impact the behavior of the APIs. Yeah. Um, and, and so one of the best things that you can do if you, are, if you are operating a cloud, if you are selling a cloud to somebody, is to actually be continuously testing what you're doing to make sure that um, the changes don't have unexpected side effects for your users. Because that's been the biggest pain point for everybody who's been trying to, been trying to pass into interoperability, is they come in, they make a change, and they don't, and that, and that change, they may think that they've covered that change and ha how it impacts one API, but they don't realize that it changes the behavior of other APIs. And, and, and I just want to add that if you, uh, if you do the test, please test the whole set of APIs, uh, not just the must pass test. With that set of API, you give us, you give us a lot of data so that we can, we can do a me more meaningful uh, uh, nexus of, divide the nexus of must pass test. So maybe what no. we need is a is like a, a, a wall of shame somewhere with a list yeah. of the logos of the of the vendors that aren't fully testing or testing at all uh, from DevCore, and we can put that up on the big screen of the keynotes. The, the, the board the board actually took an action when we were in this process to specifically not have walls of shame, but, but yes. it was a very good idea. But that's, but it but looks that's, like we've taken an action today, so I don't <laughs> yeah. that's, like, but that's, that's actually a funny thing, too, because, because there, are, there are members of the community who will, who will actually come out very vociferously against particular clouds and say that, you know, you're, yeah. you're, you're behaving badly, you're doing something this way. And, and again, in my personal experience, I found that that isn't, that isn't um, it's useful to know that when that someone has a problem, you know, when, when, when a product has a problem, but it's also recognizing that I don't think anybody in this community is out to, you know, create vendored things that are, you know, exclusive to them. You know, that generally when they're part of a community, they want to do the right thing. And when I, and, and again, in my personal experience is when I communicate with them, when I communicate the problems in a way that is, um, understands the vendor's concerns, because we are a community that's made up of users, developers, and vendors, um, they typically want to go back and do the right thing in their product. And, I, and I've seen that uh, several times. Well, hey, Once oh, we told them what the right thing was. We're just about so. out of time, so I oh, hate to okay. cut you guys off here, but we kind of, I think, got it into some of the other questions, but unless there's uh, any other questions in the audience right now, I'd love to hear, where do you two guys think, where do we go from here? Um, where, you know, what direction do you think will continue to set things going? I need a moment to think. Y'all okay, for, for me, um, interoperability is a journal. So we started three years ago, we, we are getting somewhere with the latest uh, uh, guideline. We have about more than 200 tests and we're including most of the, the, mo the five most important projects in there. So that is an improvement, but we know this is a journey and there's a lot of good input here and that's what we need the community involvement to keep working on the interoperability. Yeah, I think, I think we're, that the, the, the biggest success that we'll have is when interoperability is in just entirely boring, where it's, people don't think about it. It's, you, you've, you've tested, you run, you know that OpenStack clouds work, and I, and I, I think we're on that path. I think that we're on that path, and, it's, and, that, and that we're gonna reach that point in, you know, in a year or two. You know, I, think, I think we're doing good work. Yeah, I agree with those points. I, I think that it's important for the users, the people consuming OpenStack clouds, to ask the vendors, ask their ops teams to conform to the tests. That the biggest liability I see or danger I see with interoperability in OpenStack is that it's not a, it's not a user consumer driven thing right now. That will make the vendors conform and adopt and move faster. So we have to have people in this room, we have to have people in the community asking and demanding that the interop tests are being followed. That's where the power of, of DEF Core is gonna come from and the interoperability committee. Without that power, they're not gonna be able to enforce things and then OpenStack will, will go back to a, a multi-headed beast. Yeah, I think I would really like to see a, a lot more people uh, looking through the, the, the stuff on the OSOPS repo. Um, there's Terraform, there's Ansible, 
and there might be some heat as well for deploying a bunch of interesting tooling. And to have more, more people, whether they're your users or, or, or vendors or operators, testing those out on, on your clouds and maybe making pull requests to improve them and make the, them more interoperable. I know when I was doing the Terraform ones, I made a few decisions that were like, these are pretty blue box specific, but I can like guess at what other people are doing or I can just leave those specific things in there. So I would bet a bunch of them, if you tried to run them on your cloud, they would like almost work, not quite work. And I would like to find those bots and keep improving them and have like a, a place you can send people to. Here are some really good, you're like reference level, um, versions of you know the elk stack or whatever it is that you can install using these tools to help you learn what the cloud what the cloud's capabilities are and also how to use tools to interact with them in a, in a, in a very uh, devopsy and finger quotes way okay and I, i'm pretty sure we're all out of time here but did want to remind people i believe is it at 11 a.m that i think catherine and brad have another session discussing the interop challenge and rocky and rocky and so i and <laughs> everyone is invited to that because I think there's still a lot more to be discussed and I think it'd be great to continue discussion. Are, are there any last questions from you in the room? Or I think, like I said, let's be respectful to the next set of presenters in this room. Oh. So hi, um, I'm the guy who's basically responsible for ensuring that Cloud Foundry installs on OpenStack. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm so sorry. The, yeah, and and from the from the most recent uh, user survey, we saw this is like the second most popular workload people install on OpenStack, and still it's like almost impossible to make sure that it installs on Bluebox as well as on all of the other OpenStacks which are out there, right? So I'm still not sure after following this discussion, how are we going to improve that? I mean, it's like. You're saying uh, that vendors should adhere to a set of tests. Uh, unfortunately, everything covered in, in RevStack or DevCore is way insufficient to, to make sure it installs, which led us to basically develop our own test suite. Mm -hmm. right? so, yeah. so we are now pushing that out to people saying, hey, if you run that and everything is green, then um, you're about to be sure that it actually installs. So, so I, this I, should work out of the box, right? This is right. So, so uh, as we say, uh, this is a journey. So, uh, absolutely, we're not there. So, th what you say is where we want to get to. Um, when we started this, uh, and 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 Chris, Rob can talk, and uh, Mark can talk about this. When we define the set of uh, DevCo criteria. The mean to start with is to get community involvement. We don't mean to, to fail a lot of people to begin with. So to attract the uh, community involvement is goal number one. Of course, getting to the stage where you say you can test your Cloud Foundry. It's just a workload that you call the underlying API. Um, that is where we want to get to. Are we there yet? I don't think so. And you know that. Yeah, and, I, and Mark, just for my, um, my personal interest, would you, would you put a link to the yes. Cloud Foundry yeah. tests in, uh, into the Etherpad we have up here? Because yeah, sure. I, I think I'm interested in seeing it. Right. This, this to me reinforces what I'm trying to say about it has to be uh, end client driven, right? If, if, if the end users aren't putting pressure on the vendors about, hey, wait a second, you passed Def Core, the ref stack, but you didn't, it still doesn't work, it's still not compatible. That lets us bring more tests into it, it lets us continue to, mm -hmm. to tighten what those compatibility issues are. Um, but it, it can't just be something that's done from the board down, it really has to be the consumer saying, I want compatible clouds, I want a tighter spec, um, and the vendors have to do it. There, there are vendors who don't participate in this effort major vendors who don't participate in this effort. Um, and so when you think about that, you know, there's plenty of people who can ship OpenStack, meet the, I'll, I'll be brutally honest, there are vendors who can meet the spec and ship on OpenStack and set it up and it won't conform in the field. Yeah, okay? exactly. That's, that's that, is what, that is your experience, that is what you are seeing. And the only way we're gonna get that to stop 
is when the people who are buying that cloud run RefStack themselves and say, WTF vendor, fix this. That's how that gets fixed. Otherwise, you, you, you're not, it's not going to, all, all we're doing is, is creating some nice marketing blitz at that point until the, until the users care and yep. tell the vendors they, they're, they're not going to accept it. Okay, thanks. All right, I, I think we're painfully over time here. I just want to thank all the panelists and, and everyone in attendance. I think this is a great session. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. That's actually a good closing cut.